features that are quite different from what we know in quantum web mixes. I will also give you only a few words about uh, recent things we are doing on chaos multiplexing, so how you can uh, multiplex chaos being transmitted between emitter and receivers in a single carrier, a uh, single signal. Uh, and then when, as Damia said, I'm uh, also in a land where it's quite a long expertise on photorefractive and non-linear optics. Uh, so I will also discuss a little bit things we are doing on optical patterns. So the work has been done by um, uh, myself, also with the Finger of the G, who is also my wife and is coming here uh, with me during this week. Uh, and also quite a lot of, uh, of good students, uh, Lucas uh, and Nicolai finished their PhD. And there are still uh, three PhD students, uh, Damien Montagné who is finishing this year, and Andreas and Vianney who have started in October. Uh, I've put a, a strong acknowledgement to the Lorraine Conseil Régional, which is the, like the, the local policy of uh, the region uh, around us, because they gave me an award for best researcher that gave me funding to come here. So when I have some funding to go and visit friends and not networking with that money, so I, I want to acknowledge them. That was useful. Uh, the advice of my talk, um, so depending on the time, I will see maybe I might skip a few things. Um, but uh, the, the initial plan is to talk about um, a few words about our, our group, uh, also then to move to the quantum dot things, um, discussing first the quantum dot mixes, and then a few theoretical works we've been doing on excitability and self-pulsation. 
uh, Chaos Multiplexing, a uh, few works about two setups that we have been doing theoretically, one using multiple time delays, and the other one using active passive decomposition of uh, these diodes. And then discuss optical patterns um, for uh, pattern formation and pattern control using the lattice and drifting uh, patterns. Uh -huh. Should work? No? Doesn't work? I think I should change something. It's on. It's gone. Okay. Um, so a few words about um, about us. So Superlake is an engineering school um, doing electrical engineering. So it typically graduates about 440 students per year. Um, and the, the specific things of Superlek is that uh, it is located on three cities. So one is in Paris, in Rennes, uh, and one is in Metz. So it covers the uh, eastern to western part uh, of France. It is typically run to what is called the Grand École in France. I don't like so much that word. Uh, I know I'm recording that. I don't like so much that word because it means like uh, good schools and bad schools. But it's a word that has uh, quite a long history in France, like Ecole Normale Supérieure and so on. So we are ranked among these Grand Écoles. And we graduate a large number of students. And of course, uh, we offer them specialization degrees. And we typically have around 20 students per year being graduated in photonics. And the photonics specialty is done only in Metz. So those students who enter in Paris or in Rennes have to move to Metz during their studies to do their specialization degree. Uh, it's very original way, I think, of, of doing a, a diploma of engineering in France because it means a lot of mobility of students and also of professors. So we are teaching in Paris and in Rennes and people are moving. Uh, so Metz campus, I have a picture there. You have a, a quite big campus with a student residence in front of the lake, so it's quite beautiful. Okay, thank you. So it's quite a nice uh, atmosphere for work. And these are a few pictures of the, of the city of Metz, and uh, this is the new Modern Art Museum, which is called the Pompidou Museum. If you know Paris, there is also the Pompidou Museum in Paris. This one is the second one in, uh, uh, in Europe, so it's, it's in Metz, uh, and it has brought a lot of tourists and, and new facilities. There will be a very big exhibition center to be built in 2012, so uh, it will open a lot of uh, opportunities. Uh, now about us, uh, the situation is a bit complicated. Uh, so I'm, I'm leading a group uh, in Superdeck who is doing optics and electronics, and it takes uh, uh, the it has about uh, eight permanent uh, people, among which we have professors, but also people who are doing mostly teaching and not necessarily doing research today. Uh, and we have also quite a good number of PhD students coming from. Uh, from different countries and all over Europe, also in the US and Japan. Um, and that group, in fact, is part of a bigger lab, uh, which is called the LMOPS, uh, for Material Optics, Photonics and System. And that lab so includes our group, and also we are a joint lab with the Georgia Tech Syllabus group, where some, some of you uh, know already some, some people who have been working there in the past. And the political aim, uh, most probably in the next uh, two, three years, will be to build a unique lab that merge the two things. Uh, politically, it's a bit complicated because this uh, belongs to France. I mean, there's French kind of regulations, and this is linked to the US. So we need to be uh, OK on the way we treat, in particular, the intellectual properties. But uh, so I'm, I'm leading that part of the lab which has roughly um, these four topics, so nonlinear <coughs> dynamics of laser, light safe organization, which includes patterns. And then there are two topics I'm not discussing that much, but they are expanding. Uh, design of photonic components, it brings us a lot of contractual uh, activities with industries. And also we are working hard on new UV laser sources because we have an MOVP uh, facility uh, in mass uh, devices. So, uh, yeah. Here are some pictures of the facilities we have. So uh, we have different things to analyze the special solitons because that was the only three in the lab. 
Um, we have different sources, especially because we are working laser in telecom kind of applications, so 850 nanometer up to uh, under 10 and 1550 nanometer uh, lasers and mixers. We have also uh, high power laser like NDI frequency double. We have also uh, sources at uh, around 1 micron also to analyze special solitons. We have different uh, type of crystals. We don't grow them, but we, we buy them almost everywhere. In particular, there is a strong interest today in those photorefractive crystals called medium phosphide doped with iron because those are typically grown in epitaxy of semiconductor lasers. And uh, this material can be photorefractive if you dope it with iron. So it's quite interesting because it's fast, not as usual in photorefractive. Uh, these are some, some labs we have. And we've put also a lot of effort recently in building pedagogical kits. So we have guys in our labs who, have, uh, who are selling those kits to, to, to universities, for example. And it's a big business. There's something like hundreds of customers in the last year. So we are selling those kits. Uh, for example, uh, one is made uh, in the lab. It's an electro-optic modulator to, to understand how optical communications are working. So let us move to the scientific part. So the quantum dot things first. So as you know from solid state physics or quantum physics, as soon as you are uh, looking to carriers that are moving in a, in a 3D space, so as soon as you want to discretize uh, the motion of the carriers and you move from bulk material to quantum wires or to quantum wires and then quantum dots, so you, you discretize more and more the confinement of the carrier and at, at the end you end up that uh, only uh, the, the available density of states is discretized in energy. So in those materials, if one is able to grow quantum dots, basically what will end up is that those nanostructures will make possible to have states only at discrete energies like it happens in individual atoms. So there is a strong interest in, for example, building it from solid state physics because this would help us to understand also how many. The kind of behaviors uh, in semiconductor physics that resemble the one you have in atomic states when they have a transition and, and radiative processes. So there has been a strong interest uh, in recent years in making these quantum dots, so these small boxes that confine the carriers in three dimension uh, in a semiconductor uh, laser. For example. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, there are many techniques, but these are the two most important, most valuable uh, ways to grow these dots. So you have to do this artificially, they don't come uh, naturally. So you have to do this artificially, and, and to my knowledge, the, the first technique that has been suggested was in fact done by luck. Because if you want to grow a semiconductor laser, you have to pay careful to the lattice matching. And some people, especially those who were working on Dixus uh, quite a long time ago, they understood very much that if they want to have long wavelength Dixus, that was a big problem because the active medium was not lattice matched to the mirrors. So those people said, okay, let us do it. So they grow things that were not lattice matched. And if you put a layer that is not lattice matched to another one, you have some strain and apparently some redistribution of the strain can end up in the formation naturally and spontaneously the formation of ions that will in fact play the role of the quantum dots. I mean, it will play the role of 2D confinement and then kind of quantum dot plays the properties. Um, I will come back to the disadvantage of this, but this is typically called the stransky krasanov or SP uh, growth, which is not much controlled or controllable, but basically it means that you have end up with islands of dots that grow up on top of what is called then a wetting layer. So that wetting layer will be uh, beyond the quantum dot and will in fact have the, the carries to move to the dots in a kind of what is called a capture, capture process. Another technique, and I'm, I'm not that much a specialist in that, but another technique people told me is that, uh, and we have some device on that, that typically if you are growing uh, super lattices, so you are growing very thin epitaxial layers, if you play on the thickness of the layer, on the sub monolayer level, you can also have this spontaneous growth of the quantum dust that appear on top of those monolayer thin super lattice. So you end up with these black areas that in fact contain quite large number of quantum dots. So you have those two techniques for growing these things, the Stransky Krasanov and the sub monolayer techniques. And it ended up with what we call stranky press enough for some layer quantum locations. 
advantage and disadvantages. So, uh, from the laser physics theory, it's quite well known that if you start to reduce the volume of where the carriers are confined and also where the radiative processes are taking place, then finally you end up also that you need less energy to get into the basin. So you need basically less, uh, in terms of laser diode, you need low threshold current density, so you need very small current or current density to end up in the lasing process. We have a high gain, so with S. And all these advantages are very important, of course, if you want to build efficient devices. Uh, it has been proved or it has been studied recently also that they might have quite a lot of improvement in the stability in temperature and also to external perturbations like optical feedback for, for different reasons. However, the performance today are strongly limited by the technology because if you grow these things uh, artificially on top of a wetting layer or inside a super lattice, basically you don't control that much neither the number you have of dots, neither the size of the dots, neither the homogeneity of the dots. So basically, and you are much more specialist on that than me, you end up with a large ensemble of oscillators that have you believe or almost the same frequencies but then they have different geometries and that finally behave like either correlated or weakly correlated ensemble of large number of oscillators. So it has most probably uh, interesting things to be done on the synchronization of large networks of things. Uh, but uh, in terms of technology, that's a big, uh, that's a big problem to them. And so the performances of those devices are good in terms of threshold and modulation speed, but they are typically either not so much reproducible or at least you will see also in our experiment that you can take hundreds of devices, you can see also many different things. So, uh, quantum dust, you can grow them, they have advantages, but I'm studying here and I will discuss today mostly quantum dust vixels. So, uh, stories on vixels, uh, you know, Maxi and many people here, they know this very well. So, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers have been attracting uh, in the 80s for a lot of interesting properties. Just to remind you that those vertical cavity laser diodes are emitting from the surface, so they have a growth of an active layer between two mirrors, and the light is, is coming up from the top or from the bottom. The volume of the cavity is much smaller than in the classical laser emitting lasers, so you end up again with a small pressure current. The beam can have a very nice circular shape, and all these advantages are one. Well there is an interest, and I have been interested in my PhD on that, that when you have a vixel, because of the cylindrical geometry of the waveguide, most of the vixels are cylindrical, uh, with cylindrical geometry. Most uh, of those devices, in fact, do not have, for geometrical region of the waveguide, but also for the gain properties, do not have necessarily any preference for a polarization state. So, in fact, uh, you might believe that uh, you could have a linear, elliptical, circularly polarized light, or whatever. But it was shown already in the first devices that were grown that typically when you grow a vessel, you have weak anisotropies in the cavity, like linear, mostly linear cavity anisotropies, that finally end up with a linearly polarized light, but in either one or x or y orthogonal directions, and these are aligned with the crystallographic axis of the, of the device, of the substrate. But uh, it was uh, quickly discovered that since the polarization selection is very weak, except for these weak linear cavity isotropies, as soon as you will change the device temperature or the injection current or you will play on the parameters of the device, you can easily observe the switching. The switching between these two polarization states, which is here electrically driven, so by the current, but it can be temperature driven or it can be also optically injected driven or whatever. So those vixels, uh, for me and for most of the communities, have been very interesting for those polarization selection, polarization switching properties. And this is just another picture of what happens. So you typically, as you increase the current in a vixel, the power switch between uh, one state which has one wavelength and another state which has a slightly different wavelength because of these linear cavity and other properties, very features. I want to, to tell you a little bit more, and it will be the aim of my talk on quantum dots, that uh, if you look carefully, either at the current where the laser is switching, but there could be more exotic situations. But typically, if you drive exactly the vixel where it has to hesitate between the X polarization and the Y polarization, because of the noise that happens in the device, like the spontaneous emission noise or whatever, the laser in time, 
We also hesitate, so we test this opting between the X and the Y polarization states, and the opting can be slow, so it can have a second time scale or millisecond time scale, it can be also nanosecond time scale, I will come back to that. But just remind you that the VIXERs, when they switch, they hesitate not only between this full polarization, but also in time, in a kind of mode opting kind of dynamics. Now, about quantum dot VIXERs. So this is most probably one of the, the most common kind of structure of a quantum dot vixel. You recognize what are, you, not a question of technology, but these are distributed drag reflectors, basically these are mirrors, yes. You have the, the cavity here, which is the active medium of the laser. And inside this active medium, you have here the spontaneous growth on each epitaxial layer of these islands that confine the cavities in 3D, these islands of dots. So these are indium gallium arsenide quantum dust grown on gallium arsenide. So these are basically deposition of indium in case where it doesn't like to be on gallium arsenide. So it means that three energy distribution and the formation of, of these ions of dots. And you have these dots filling the active medium. Uh, this device is quite sophisticated. I mean, it's, it's quite modern or it's quite uh, technologically advanced in the sense that it has here an oxide confinement. So there are aluminium gallium oxide layers that confine the field and make this oxide super aperture of the device. And it has also an intracavity contact. So it has here the current is not injected from the top, but it's injected directly in the active layer, which makes things much better because the current doesn't have to flow through the mirror before entering the cavity. So those devices have a much better performance than, than others. Then the question I'm asking is, okay, People gave us those quantum dot vixels, and uh, okay, what are the polarization properties of those quantum dot vixels? Do you believe these things would behave like quantum wells or classical vixels, or would you be believe that there should be something special that might be due to the dots or whatever? One question mark. Yeah. What is the diameter of these oxide uh, layers? Of the aperture, you mean? Yeah, the aperture. Uh, uh, it's, it's more like the vixels. So it was around 10 micron, 5 to 10 micron aperture from device to device. It was small area mixes. So this is the experimental results on a few uh, hundreds of devices we got. And we got two classes of devices. Some of them were grown, the dots were grown by a thermal layer technique, and some of them were grown by a strongly pressed enough technique. And basically what we observe is that the Stranky Krasanov uh, lasers have a large distribution of the polarization states where they want to emit the maximum power. So basically the initial polarization of all those lasers is almost randomly distributed. It has some maximum still around 0 and 90 degrees, which is the X and the Y polarization, like in quantum wave vixels, but we have also other things that might happen. And in the sun monolayer lasers, they are only aligned along the vertical or the horizontal axis, much less distributed. So those devices have apparently not a naive polarization property. I mean, they initially laze with a polarization which is not necessarily oriented linearly polarized along 0 or 90 degrees. But moreover, when you start to drive the current, yeah. How, do you <coughs> how do you define the zero degrees in a given So the zero is aligned around the vertical axis and then all these angles are... How do, you choose, how do you choose the zero? The, or a given pixel. You know, a given pixel starts to rise on, with a real polarization for how you determine what is the zero direction. We do it by reference uh, to an axis. Then you take the reference axis like the vertical, you turn the polarization and then you take that... Or we do have a cryptographic axis, automatically. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. So yeah, we have yeah. cryptographic axis. We the we know them. Yeah, we know. Part of the top layer. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. might not be the, the axis on the on the layer. Uh, because can you can you go and uh, do you know? We the know the cryptographic axis of the substrate. Those okay. Are so you you refer to the substrate. Yeah, yeah. That's like I mean as usual. I mean I think like in quantum physics, you always refer to the preferential axis of the substrate. Of course, I agree. We don't know the system. So, moreover, what happens when you drive the current is the following. I mean, this is a typical scenario. So, first of all, not all of them are switching. 
So not all of them are switching. And those who are switching typically have those behaviors. So let us start. So you start to increase the current. The laser starts driving here with the Y polarization, which is, for example, the, the, the vertical polarization. And here, at some current, you start to see excitation of the other polarization along X. But now, if you look this more carefully, if you start to turn the polarizer, in fact, you will discover that at some current, there is a drop of power when you look to the polarizer at 45 degrees. So if you turn the polarizer at 45 degrees, you see that for some current, there is an exchange of power with someone else, or with another polarization state, and we come back to that. And starting from that point, around 2.1 milliamp, we have a large range of current where the polarization is changing in time like a mode of intensity. Now let us come back to that range of current. So in fact, by measuring the power we have for different polarization orientation, we end up with the fact that these are the polarization states that happen for current beyond the point A. So we have two elliptically polarized states that happen at the current point A. So the laser is start lasing in linear polarization state that it has the onset of an elliptically polarized state but not one, it has, it has the onset of two polarization states that are elliptically polarized states. You see the maximum, the major axis is at 70 degrees with respect to zero, the minor axis is at minus 20 degrees. And there is also something special is that the two elliptically polarized states there are not orthogonal. Are those the submonolayer or the spastic expansion? This was the submonolayer. In fact, with the Swansky press up, we never have polarization switching, but we don't know necessarily why. It's kind of that this was, so this behavior has been seen in 15 devices. The current is not necessarily the same as with the switch, but they always saw the same things. So what is interesting is that we have now a scenario for switching that involves a linearly polarized state, an elliptically polarized state, competition between two elliptically polarized states, and then you end up with a huge range of current where the two polarization states are up in time. Let us go back to, to this stage one. Uh, you all know this very well. When you add the mode ping time of dynamics, you typically like to make statistical analysis of the time you stay in one polarization mode. And if you make the statistical analysis, we see exactly the same exponential law like you have in a two-state escape from pharmaceuticals. So also things that have been seen in quantum well mixes. We also did another thing, it's a modulation experiment. <laughs> so we modulate the injection current inside and outside the switching region. And we discovered that if you modulate the current too fast, and typically too fast is 100 megahertz, then you don't see any switching anymore. So it means that the switching is most probably slow, or at least it's of most probably less than 100 megahertz kind of current. So most probably of thermal origin. But uh, here are two interesting features. So, linear states, elliptically polarized states, polarization mode of being. All these things are quite known also for quantum wave mixes, except these two things. What we do is to measure the dwell time, so the time you stay in one polarization state, as a function of the current. And remember that we have a huge range of current where we have these polarization mode of being times, uh, time of dynamics. What we see is that the time you stay in one mode decrease from second to nanosecond in that range of current and then there is a small increase back okay so here you see the time straight so you start with a mode of ping at the second time scale then you end up with nanosecond time scale there is a small increase of the output moment. and now look back to the literature the literature will tell you like William said in 99 that in vixels in quantum wave vixels explained by Kramer's law for the two state scale the time you stay in one mode should in fact increase with the current. The only difference is that in that work in 99, in Vixus, it's very hard to have a huge range of current like that where you have a mode of in. So typically what people do is they try to change the switching point. So they increase the current, in fact they increase the switching point, so they increase the range of current where they have the bistability. They typically do it by a hotspot technique or strain like they do in Brussels, for example, things like that. But here, we don't need to do that. I mean, we have a range of current of about 2 million where we have that mode of time scale. So it's also a first, to my knowledge, a first case where you don't need to change the switching point to observe that range of dynamics in the mode of You have it naturally on the device. 
But still, we see the opposite. So we see a dual term that decreases with the increase of current, while we have a dual term that should increase with the increase of current. So if one of you is interested, we have today no idea of why it's being like that. So most probably, it has, we believe, it has to do with the fact that we are working with elliptically polarized that are not orthogonal also. So we have to modify a little bit the story we have about that. So we might have kind of asymmetric towards potential things like that. But we don't know. But still, I mean, this is very peculiar to a device, very reproducible. All of quantum dot lasers are behaving like that. Now there is another thing that is very, that is very uncommon. Mark, excuse me. Yeah. Is uh, separation gain important in these devices at those levels of power? We don't know, we don't measure it. But typically in quantum dot laser, separation of the gain is strong. But we don't measure it, so, but, I mean, in other things that have been measured, typically it's not that it's strong. It's also a reason why they are much less sensitive to all these kind of injection of feedback, all those things. Um, so there is another thing that is peculiar. Uh, in the story of the San Miguel Fenge Bologna model, yes, the, the one on this is long one, yeah, long story. Um, it was predicted, and was also working on that when I was doing my PhD, it was predicted that you could have a polarization switching scenario that has a linearly polarized state, an elliptically polarized state, and you end up with a linearly polarized state. Exactly like we have. Yeah. But it was predicted that as soon as the elliptically polarized state should end up to the linearly polarized state, they might suddenly have a dynamical state. So you might see spontaneously in the laser the excitation of a self position. To my knowledge, there is one experiment uh, by Thorsten Ackerman and, and Mark Sonderman that has shown that close to the switching point, you have these kind of optical spectra that show side bands. They don't measure the time traces, so it's very hard to know exactly what is the self-pulsation, but what is known is that the dynamic that could appear there is anyway at the biofusion frequency. So biofusion frequency in that case was quite small, three, four, five years. What we see here is something maybe closer, I don't know, but maybe closer, we are working on that now, but maybe closer to what was expected there. We see, in fact, that inside the polarization mode doping, so we have, the difference with that is that we have a huge range of, of switching things, in fact, yeah. range of current where the switching happens. But what we see is that always we have sideband excitation along the main peak that correspond to the switching polarization. Yes? So we have the main peak that correspond to the elliptically polarized state 1, elliptically polarized state 2. And on each side of this main peak, you always have this huge peak, I mean huge peaks, this quite well resolved peak, yes? <laughs> David will correct me. In experiment, you always want to have that. You will see them very well. Eh? You see these peaks very well, and these are exactly located at the relaxation of station frequency of all laser at the current at which you are investigating the peaks. So in fact, what I want to say is that these devices are not only naturally producing elliptically polarized state, which is, to my knowledge, not easily seen in quantum releases. Moreover, they have a switching dynamics with hopping, which scales inversely proportionally to the current like the story is known in quantum world. And moreover, that has a dynamical scenario with relaxation oscillation frequency 10 years, and not by a frequency. So now the question, and it's open for today because I don't have the answer, is whether this is a dynamic due to the fact that we are on a quantum node vessel, or is it due to the fact that we have just a device that has either wave guiding properties or leading properties, whatever, that are big different from the quantum wave devices. People who are growing the dust cannot tell you the answer. So for example, it would be interesting to test the device with different shape of the dot, some geometries of the dots, or different things like that. But I mean, just for me, who has been working a long time on this San Miguel Fang model, I was quite, quite happy to see a scenario that in fact involves all the states. It involves the linear polarized state, the APT polarized state, the dynamical state, the relaxation of the things in the linear polarized states. So that's all for the quantum node distance. Uh, so, I will just tell you a few words about theoretical words that we are doing on quantum node lasers as well. So you all know that when you have a master laser and a slave laser and you inject light from one to the other, you might have 
a large range of nonlinear dynamical groups. Yes. It depends a lot on how much power you inject, and it, it depends a lot on the detuning between the master and the slave reason. So typically, what people have seen experimentally and theoretically is that as you scan the detuning and the injection strengths, you have a large locking region. So you have a large region where the slave laser locks in frequency to the master laser. But you have also bubbles or areas surrounded by parallel doubling bifurcation where you have the laser driven into chaos. So that has been well studied. And just to tell you that along the saddle node bifurcation, as you know, you create a saddle and a node, and they appear out of equilibrium. So this saddle node bifurcation, in fact, has been since long interesting for another property, which is the fact, and this is uh, quite technical, but uh, along the saddle node bifurcation, so the one that bore the locking, it was since long, and, and Sebastian Dixorek has, has predicted that much. It was long expected that you should have an homoclinic bifurcation that is born on the saddle node bifurcation, and that homoclinic bifurcation should be responsible for the fact that the laser should become excitable. So because you have a saddle and a node that appear outside or inside this locking region, the saddle and the node, like any classical mechanism for excitability, could, could drive the laser into excitable process. This was predicted somewhere, you know, long in the 80s, also in the 90s, and then people wanted to see this experimentally. And it was quite curious, but experimentally, people have seen that, but in a quantum dot laser. I know that people have seen that also, you know, but not published in a quantum way either, but this is very controversial today. But at least there is one paper that has been published that is claiming very strongly about excitability in an injection process. And not only they see excitable pulses, so they see suddenly the laser wire in the rest, so it fires a big pulse, but they also see that you can have double pulses of excitability. In fact, this is very artificially due to a parallel doubling bifurcation here. I might give you two pulses instead of one. But we were a bit puzzled by that, or at least we were wondering a lot about that experiment. That was experimentalism. And before doing any experiment, because that's quite hard, and especially on the quantum dot vixels, we wanted to look a little bit more to the theory. And as we know from all excitability definition, and in, this is from neuron uh, systems, but uh, it's very applicable to the laser system. So typically, a neuron has membrane potential in a rest state, so it has a, at least a fixed point, which is an equilibrium. And if you perturb that equilibrium, it has either exhibit what is called the, the postsynaptic potential, so the membrane potential will slightly increase and then this bump is going back, so it is a damped a nonlinear oscillator. But you could, if you stimulate the, the, the neuron very strongly, yeah, the membrane potential, instead of taking back to the rest, might fire that pulse. So this is typically the definition of excitability. The perturbation is strong enough to fire a motion in the phase space that goes back to the equilibrium and makes the firing of pulse. And after there is some threshold of the perturbation, whatever is the perturbation, the spike is always the same. But it's also well known from excitability people that you should also have a, a possibility to have those spikes not be due to a perturbation, but being self-sustained. So you should be able also to have the same trajectory like a limit cycle oscillator where you would have the spike, like a periodic spiking, and not being due to a perturbation or to a neuron, but like a self-sustained process. And in the experiment on the quantum dot laser diode, of course the device is noisy, so it's very hard to say, okay, let's just remove the noise. But I mean, it was claimed that it was excitability. That is not excitability, that is a self-sustained oscillator. So my, I mean, I was just wondering whether that system allows to have also self-sustained excitable pulses, or excitable light pulses, or does it have only this excitability? So basically, we did a theoretical modeling of that. So I will not go into the detail, but just to tell you for those who are interested, that, that model, in fact, we extend the classical model of, of the quantum laser injection to accounting also for what is called excited state and ground state. So the quantum dotator may have simultaneous lasing in two radioactive channels along the excited state and ground state. And we have an optical injection model for these things. Just to tell you that we, we managed to, although the model is more complicated, of course, as you complexify more a model, you get more data. So that's a very naive process. But it's also interesting to see if you find back the simple things. 
So indeed, we find back that scenario where you have the homoclinic bifurcation that is lying on the southern node, and we have the period doubling bifurcation here that delimit the region of single pulse and double pulse excitability. So this is very well known, so this is very reliable. But then we also saw that we have huge regions, in fact, much, much bigger regions than the excitable ones. We have huge regions like C1, C2, and C- minus on positive and negative detuning, where the spikes that are normally due to perturbation like noise or numerical perturbation that are self-sustained. So we have a huge region where we have those spikes that belong, uh, that, that, that appear spontaneously like a limit cycle oscillator, and that are in fact on the other side of the sudden node bifurcation. So on one side, close to the locking, you have the excitable pulse, on the other side, you have the self-sustained uh, pulses. And there it gives you some puzzling things, because then you might wonder experimentally, what do they see? Do they see the self-sustained pulses? So this is not excitability. This is a limit cycle oscillator. Do they see this perturbed by noise? Or do they see excitability due to noise? So we are still discussing a lot with them to know exactly what could be the answer. So just to tell you the time between the pulses scale as you move away from the saddle node, so this is well known from any excitability or kind of uh, excitability process. Yeah. 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 The, the statistics of the pulses should be different on both sides. We see. Oh, on positive or negative detuning? Or on no, on, I mean, on, I mean yeah. the statistics of the pulses in the oscillatory regime and in the excitable regime, in presence of noise, they should be different. I'll show you something, maybe you might have a comment on that. So, uh, j just to tell you about this, this you know, so um, what happens is that as you move away from the saddle node bifurcation, so you have just a fixed point. You don't have the saddle, and the saddle is the one that is responsible for this long motion towards the equilibrium point in excitability. But what is interesting is that as soon as you move away from the saddle node and you end up with only a fixed point, you might also have the same motion, so like the excitable pulses, but like a limit cycle oscillator. And this is in fact classically known like the bottleneck phenomenon by Strogas. So it's what's explained in his book. There is also a classical bottleneck kind of scaling law, which we also see uh, here. Yes, so everything here is well recorded. But indeed, as Perry is saying, it's interesting to look now to let us take the self-sustained pulsations and let us put noise. Okay? And let us make the statistics of these things. Ooh, my picture is very bad. Oh, it's better on my screen, I don't know. But I will tell you what is observed, yes? So, depending on the detuning, you might ever have a statistical law like that, yes? Either you might have, and you don't see it, you might have like a Dirac function. Because in fact, the detuning will make the pulses faster and faster. And in fact, as you move close to the standard node, you end up with a very fast process where you finally have almost all the times being the same. So the statistical distribution will be either shaped like a direct function or like this. And in fact, I was very puzzled because experimentally, what they saw was exactly this. You don't see it. But there is a direct function and exactly the same. So now the problem is, I mean, I don't know, but you might comment more on that. Is that it's very hard for me to know where they are. Do they are outside the locking region in the self-sustained process just for a third by nose so that we get this statistical process? Or do they are inside the locking region where they would have excitability and I don't know what should be the statistical process experimentally so they cannot remove noise. So uh, it's quite a hard question. But it was an interesting work because it proves somehow that, in fact, instead of looking to excite, I mean, the, the looking for excitability is a bit more complicated because the region of self sustained pulses is huge in comparison to the region of excitability. Uh, I will not have time, but just to mention you one application that was very naive, but I mean, I said, okay, let me try it. Um, I know that Damia is also working on that today. Um, once you have excitability or self-sustained like excitable pulses, you might think of using that for optical signal processing. Uh, so for example, imagine the signal, you, you receive a signal like an optical injection field, and that signal is very deteriorated, so attenuated or perturbed or whatever. And if you use that signal to inject light, 
what will happen is that if you are exactly in that range of parameters, if you inject a lot of light, you go into the locking. If you inject a weak amount of light, then you end up into this self-sustained, excitable light pulsing dynamics. Yes? So in fact, injection of a strong light will make the system in a rest state, and injection of a weak light will make it firing pulses. So it's like an opposite, like a, a, a null gate, a null signal, yes? You, you make it a binary one, it will be a response equal to zero, and the binary zero will be a response equal to one. So we did that, in fact, so again, it's quite hard to see, in fact, um, what will happen, but you have a sequence of bits, and that's what the laser is doing, yes? Each time it gets back to the excitable light system, it's not excitability, so I call it excitable light, but okay, it's self sustained. It fires pulses. Each time it goes to the locking state, it's, it's in rest. There are, however, two issues about that. One is that the system, if you ask him to fire that pulse, he will not say, okay, immediately. Okay? He will have some activation time which is going on in excitability. And that activation time finally can be quite long in comparison to the bit duration. And the second problem is that if you ask him to fire a pulse, he might just say, no, I fire one, two, three, or four pulses. So we might end up with weak one, yes, or, or badly one signals. Instead of having one, one, you get one, 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 one. So you have to think a little bit about that. And the best performance, this has never been published. I mean, we didn't publish that because we don't need it published in, into applications, but okay. I mean, that was so fun, but interesting. You can make an offline statistical analysis of what is the activation time. And you may, can make an, a distribution and you can have a mean activation time. That helps you, in fact, to, to say, okay, I know that the system is delayed. It will not activate the pulse immediately, it activates with a delay. And that might help you to decide when you want to account for a one or a zero. But also, I mean, then you have to account for these multiple pulses, right? The best performance we got was an error free. Uh, recovery of the message, so you get the, the narrow free recovery of the message that's about uh, 4 gigabit per second, which is okay, but you see it's not that good in fact. And the system is very perturbed, but that might be an interesting application. Okay, so I'm running a bit out of time. So, about chaos multiplexing, I have much less to say, and I don't know, I mean, I know you have been working out on that. So, um, so that sends the story about quantum dots. Uh, again, experimentally there are very funny things that we don't understand, so you might need your help, your help if you want. An optical injection inducing excitability that's causing a lot from the experimental side mostly, because the theory is still quite complete. But experimentally that might be some work to be done on the statistics as you said earlier. Now about chaos multiplexing, I've been working also a lot on that and, and a lot of people here know very well that chaotic things that are normally not reproducible, or at least unpredictable, can be in fact perfectly reproduced and predicted if you just synchronize or just. If you at least couple two oscillators that are chaotic, even if they are chaotic, they could reproduce exactly the same chaos at the same time. So this is called synchronization, that was of course well known for classical oscillators and finally extended to chaos. And this was well applied for chaos synchronization for chaos communication, where you have an emitter and a receiver. The emitter is emitting a chaotic light that serves like a chaotic carrier, and you have a message you want to send to the other part of the room. You take that message, you plug it somehow in the chaotic carrier, you end up to the receiver, and the receiver synchronizes to the chaos, and in fact, by simple subtractions, you can get back the message encrypted into the chaos. That was known from 93 that was tested also by people in this room uh, in, in real fields and that is working well. However, there is an issue there is that if you want to do the same with 100 users so how would you do? Either you do 100 lasers, 100 receivers so you synchronize 100 lasers with 100 receivers a bit of, uh, of difficulty or you, you think about kind of multiplexing things so classically multiplexing to my knowledge, has been quite well uh, studied in, uh, in chaos communication, and I wanted to classify slightly the things that have been done in two ways. Some people have looked to pairs of emitter and receiver that are in fact single mode lasers operating at slightly different wavelengths. 
Because of course, if you have to plug all these things into a single communication channel, if you are using always lasers that have the same frequency, they might just synchronize to the wrong one, yes? So you need to take lasers that have slightly different frequencies or slightly different wavelengths and they synchronize separately. Yeah? Don't synchronize the pairs that are not normally with the good wavelengths. Other people have taken only one multimode laser emitter, one multimode laser as receiver, and using the individual modes as the chaos emitters. And that has been done for longitude modes where there you have a lot of play because you can have hundreds of longitude modes in a emitting laser. That was, for example, a setup which was suggested by Bulu and Gershaw Chavo and, and Alan Schwartz, who I work on that. Or you can, for example, use the polarization state of this. That was an experiment we did with Atsushi Ushida uh, on multi couple of discs, where you can have those two uh, Y and X modes being synchronized together. Also, famous modes in this can be synchronized. However, all these things, in fact, require, in all cases, large spectral separation either between the individual modes of the laser or between the laser <coughs> themselves. And at the end, you have a communication channel that, if it is a fiber, has a huge bandwidth, and you, in fact, are using something which is absolutely not spectrally efficient, because you want the things not to recover in spectrum domain. So the question is, can you do a multiplexing that is better spectrally efficient using the same communication channel? So one setup we suggested, uh, on which we don't have yet an experimental thing to do or to prove, was, and I will shortly discuss on that if you have questions, I will come back, but uh, it's basically uh, using two nonlinear oscillators that are time delayed. The time delay can eventually have a nonlinear function on top of it, so like the H. And what is very important is that the same signal is in fact injected into the receiver that is going back to the message or to the emitter. So in fact, technically, it's what we call an active passive decomposition. The same signal is driving the dynamics of the receiver, the dynamics of the emitter. What how we do the encryption? The encryption is done, in fact, directly on the time delay. So we take multiple time delays on linear oscillators, and the message will modulate the time delay of the nonlinear oscillator, where one emitter, one big box, yes, with many delays. So the encryption is by modulating the time delay, the rhythm of the message, and the decryption is done on correlation analysis, because the receiver will, in fact, accept to synchronize with the emitter, but the correlation will be maximum when the time delay is a good one time delay of the emitter. So that's the way the encryption is done. And we tested this on an example which is in fact taken by people in Besançon. So it's a nonlinear oscillator with an optoelectronic uh, oscillator. So it's a, it has a Max Zender nonlinearity and the voltage of the Max Zender which made the, the, the state variable in fact is delayed and is driven <coughs> back uh, optoelectronically into, into the system. So it's kind of optoelectronic feedback oscillator. And this is the emitter, this is the receiver. And we managed, in fact, to have, for example, here, four messages being sent simultaneously and we covered almost error free. Of course, there is no noise there. But you can work with noise and it's working still OK. Four users transmitting four messages at gigabit per second. And in fact, we have an aggregated bandwidth of 20 gigabit per second. So it's working very nicely. The only thing you have to be careful is that when you work on the, on the decryption process, since it's working on correlation, you have to be sure that the, the time delay you are choosing, the modulation of the time delay is not too strong so that it doesn't overlap with the correlation of the, of the other pair of messages that are sent now. But it's working okay. This is another setup that, that might be maybe also more interesting to study experimentally. These are a laser diodes, so two masters, for example, if you have two users, two slaves if you have two receivers. And the important thing is that they are uh, injecting the same uh, their message on the same communication channel. So imagine you are a receiver. And that receiver gets a chaotic signal with a lot of noisy things inside. And that the question is, that receiver, do you think that it can get back the message that should normally be the one it should receive? I mean, it gets just a mess of things, yes, like the chaotic signal. Imagine you have 100 users, yes, it's getting 100 things inside the chaotic carrier, and do you think that it will be able to recognize each single message? So, 
it's again an active passive decomposition. I will not go into the detail of the model, but it's also working nicely. So we manage, in fact, in that yeah, case. You have different wavelengths, right? The two masters. No, in that case, there are they have no different wavelengths. There are, I mean, then you have parameters. They don't need to have different wavelengths. Yeah, because in the equations, they have. Yeah, I mean. We, we we take the model as general as possible, but in the paper, in fact, we reduce a lot of mismatch in the parameters. Uh, but they don't need to have different ways. What is very important is to have a synchronization solution. Is that you have very to be very careful to to, for example, the fact that we need here. So the mass and laser are mutually coupled. And in fact, they are also subject to optical feedback, and you have to be very careful on the attenuators here so that the signal that is driving the maskers and the states are the same. So you have to be very careful on exactly the coefficients you put, but if you are careful, it's done mathematically in that paper, you can have a synchronization solution. But it's not necessarily, it's perturbed by the detuning, it's not necessarily important in the But indeed, you can have a synchronization solution, so what is very interesting is that the master one recognizes the slave one, the master two recognizes the slave two, but the master one doesn't correlate at all to the signal from the slave one doesn't correlate to the master two, and the slave two does not correlate to the master one. So there are no kind of uh, perturbation between the channels, although everything is sent on a single chaotic message. Uh, what is very interesting is that if you look now in terms of spectral efficiency, the spectral width of the transmitted message is here. It's almost the same as the spectral width of the individual messages on each individual fiber. So in fact, you are using almost the same bandwidth on the fiber. You are not just taking spectra all over the fiber like multiplexing signals. All these things are theoretically done, and maybe they might motivate for your thing to be done. Here so you are using the lag synchronization, which is the exact synchronization in open, in, with uh, an open loop uh, side. Uh, this is very mistake when you change any parameter. So like uh, it is done on pairs of emitters and receivers, so single yes. emitter, single yes. receiver, <laughs> that synchronization, of course, is exact, and it's very sensitive it's very to the parameter. It's never, it's never been used in experiment. It has been observed. Well, maybe, but it's very, I mean... It's, I, I agree. It's, it's I very mean, reliable. We did, in that paper, we published also the results on the mismatch. We end up with the same conclusion that people have seen. Typically, few percent of mismatch in parameters is already destroying the synchronization conditions. I agree with you. But it's exact. I mean, what is interesting here is that um, it proves somehow that you have a kind of uh, dual synchronization. I mean, there is a real synchronization solution. I agree with you that it is quite unstable. Most of it is experiment that might be occurring. That's all for that. Now a few minutes on patterns, if you want. So you all know that optical patterns, uh, there is a nice zoo next to Mex, uh, where they have these white tigers. There are five white tigers like this. I took a picture, it was just looking at me. Um, so if you look to the skin of the tiger, and if you look to many things like sands and chemical fluids, it's very well known that you end up with a bifurcation from an homogeneous state into something that is specially ordered that you call a pattern. Recently in optics, and I've been interested in that because that experiment was done on Vixus, in optics it was shown, uh, not recently, I mean, that I might correct you, but recently for me it's still uh, less than 15 years old. Um, so recently it was observed that normally a pattern is a solution where all the individual spots of the pattern are correlated somehow. So if you want to touch or send the information in the pattern, in fact you destroy basically the whole pattern. So in fact for optical signal processing that's not very interesting. But what people discover is that you might also have solutions that instead of being a specially ordered solution, you might also have suddenly either an isolated erasement or an isolated enhancement of one of those individual slots or individual order in the pattern, what is called a localized structure. So light localization was observed experimentally in that pixel. For example, you see suddenly spots appearing individually. So it's not a, a pattern or correlated structure, you just end up with localized peaks that appear that you can erase and enhance as you wish. So it's like you have a device that might work like pixel or memories. You want to send information there want to remove the information there, you can do what you want. The question is, how many peaks can you have? 
Uh, my answer is not many, but we will see. But most probably, of course, as soon as you need a device that is sustainably planned for S uh, energy, of course, this energy is distributed among the peaks, and at some point, you cannot have hundreds or millions of peaks that are sharing the energy. Factor synoptics roughly have been seen in different kind of configuration. One is the single feedback, where you have a nonlinear medium which is pumped and is fed back by a mirror. And in the single feedback configuration, it has been done in photorefractive, in care, in liquid crystal IVF, in sodium vapors, and whatever. And you see typically a pattern having the shape of an hexagon. This is an experiment on photorefractive by Honda in 93. This is another experiment on sodium vapors by Lange in 94. So in all cases, you see, as in the near field and the far field, the spontaneous formation of order out of an homogeneous state. It's also well known that in, in, a, in a classical linear or in a ring cavity, linear like a fabricator or in a ring cavity, like photorefractive care, vixel, active medium, whatever, you can have also the spontaneous formation of order like stripes and all these things. And all these patterns have always uh, the same properties. They are typically generated because of modulation, instability, and noise. So there should be some more bifurcation from the homogeneous state that tell you, OK, go to a normal state. The noise helps that modulation instability to be seen and to be, to be observed. But you end up with a pattern with all correlated structures. And these somehow might lead you to the localized structures and can be used for optical noise. When I entered the lab in Metz, there were a lot of people working on that box being a photo effect. They were doing special solitons. And I said, OK, let us go back to the Honda experiment by 93, where they see the hexagons. Our initial aim, go back, our initial aim was to see the hexagon, but also to see localized structure in the photorefractive single feedback case. Because that experiment by people in Nice was done in a semiconductor medium, which is a semiconductor laser. And these localized structures have properties that are well defined in theory by models. But my problem, or my feeling, was that the very difficult things there that you don't know necessarily what are is there one ingredient or many ingredients? You have spatial oboling, you have temperature, you have drift of the carriers, you have many nonlinearities in the device. For example, you see different things if they are below the threshold, above the threshold. And I was just wondering, okay, can we just take a simple nonlinear system, you know, that has one nonlinearity well defined, like a carry medium, which, which has been known by Ackerman and Lange, or like here, a photo refractive medium, and get the same. So we wanted to do localized structures in photorefractive single feedback experiments, and so we had first to prove that the device is able to make a pattern. So get back to the 93 experiment. And also we wanted to say, okay, imagine we don't end up with a localized structure. Can we still do something with the pattern? For example, can we rotate? Can we change the shape? Can we isolate one spot out of the pattern or suppress, inhibit the waveguiding in one of those constituents of the pattern? And so we look to what has been done in the control of optical patterns. And typically, what you can do is the following. By changing the position... Ah, okay. By changing the position of the mirror, you can see a large zoo or large range of hexagonal things. Yeah. You can change the shape of the pattern. It can be squeezed, it can be suddenly squared. It can be tilted, and you can have also not an hexagon, but a kind of non hexagon things. So you have a large geometry of things when you change the position of the mirror. Sorry. It's not working. Okay. Ah, yes, I don't see it on the screen. I have something there. <laughs> what you can also do is that you can apply a field to the photorefractive, and you also can change, like Mamalet and Safman, they have done in 96. You can also change the geometry of the pattern. I was surprised at that time the features were not that beautiful. was still published. You have to take them. And also what you can do is like a special filtering. You can put like a Fourier filter in that feedback experiment and also modify the shape of the pattern. But we had people from Australia visiting our lab and they asked us, okay, there is a paper by Damia Gomila saying if you have a nonlinear medium with a cavity and if you put a photonic crystal inside, it might inhibit 
or it might do a lot of things, but at least it might inhibit the propagation of the key vectors along directions you don't want. So they say, okay, why, why are you wanting to control the pattern by rotating the mirror, by applying the field and so on? Why don't you just play with the photonic crystal? And they say, okay, but how do you etch holes in my photonic, uh, my photorefractive things, or do I need to do it technologically? They say, no, no, you don't need to do it technologically. Uh, I skip those things because uh, this is just the interest of photonic crystal. They say, no, no, you don't need to do it like that. I can do it all optically. So how do they do it? A, a photorefractive crystal, by definition, is a medium where the refractive index is sensitive to the intensity of the light. So what do they do? They do a periodic elimination, and the light interference is launched into the photorefractive crystal. That periodic elimination, because the medium is light sensitive, will make a periodic variation of the refractive index in the medium. And that periodic variation of the refractive index, in fact, the definition of photonic crystal. No, the people don't like so much to talk about photonic crystal because, in our case, the periodic variation of the refractive index is very small. I mean, delta n is of the order of 10 to the minus 5. Like typically, photonic crystal picker, people, they see a huge delta n. So they invented a new word, and, and Moti Seget invited the word, so I can trust that. Eh? He said, no, no, don't talk about photonic crystal. Talk about photonic lattice. So photonic lattice is, in fact, like a light-induced photonic crystal, which has the property for me like a photonic crystal. The question, of course, is that the band gap that one could expect in a photonic crystal is much weaker in a photonic lattice because the delta n is much smaller. That might be a trick. But just as you know, imagine I have that photorefractive crystal and I'm looking for transverse wave uh, direction, yes, a wave vector along Kx, and I have a propagation along that way, yes, along the beta thing. And imagine I illuminate, I send the light in an angle to the photorefractive crystal. In a bulk medium, basically, I can have whatever propagation direction I want or propagation wave vector. However, if I have a photonic crystal, <coughs> and suddenly I make a 1D periodic variation of the refractive index, what will happen is that that beta versus Kx will not be whatever I want, but if I launch suddenly with an angle, it's known that if suddenly the angle is close to the Bragg angle, along the Kx that correspond to the first brilliant zone, I will have a photonic band gap. So there you will not have any propagation of beta. So in fact, the idea was the following. I take my hexagonal pattern in a single feedback photorefractive experiment. On top of that, I put inside the photonic a photorefractive crystal a photonic lattice. And I adjust the photonic lattice so that it inhibits the propagation of the spots I don't want in the hexagon. That was the initial idea. And if, if at the end you end up with one spot, then you are lucky. You don't talk about localized spectrum, but at least you decorrelate the things that were, I mean, that were correlated initially with the level. So we did that theoretically, and I will not go into that. You have a trick to do with photorefractive, is that the, the periodic illumination that creates the photonic lattice must be oriented in polarization orthogonally to the one that creates the, the, the hexagon. Because otherwise, you might erase the great thing that you are just creating by the next level. So you have to be careful about that, but that's all. So this is a simulation we did just to prove that uh, in photorefractive, you also end up with an hexagon, but that was also very clear. So that the input phase of the crystal, the output phase of the crystal, that the near field, the far field, so you see, suddenly the system will like to make an order state, which is an hexagonal pattern, yes. And now we did the theory and we did the experiment. Uh, I just wanted to show you uh, these things. I'm skipping a few things, sorry. So this is the interesting thing. Yeah? If the pattern intensity is above the threshold that leads to the pattern, so if suddenly you launch a large one that leads to an hexagonal pattern, if suddenly you adjust properly the lattice periodicity so that the k vector of the hexagonal pattern lie exactly along that very one zone where you expect for the photonic band gap effect. Indeed, in the Merkel simulation in an experiment, we see that you suppress the most that you don't want. So this is an experiment where you suppress those two things. Yes, you said a photonic band gap inhibition of propagation along the photorefractive crystal. So you could also do it for those spots. You could do it whatever you want. And we have then also other results that we predicted experimentally. 
And this is, uh, we discussed a little bit with Roberta, she's not there anymore, but she see also something similar in, in OPOs. Suddenly, what is very surprising, if you launch an intensity that should not give a pattern, the lattice is able not only to create a diffraction on the lattice, as usual, but also to create new modes that are, in fact, exactly where they should not exist, so at the Brillouin zone, and, in fact, you enhance them even. So you see new modes due to the lattice along the k-direction that normally should be suppressed, you enhance them. You have kind of amplification process due to a photonic lattice. And also something that was uh, very clearly seen is that um, if suddenly you see you adjust the lattice along two vectors of the hexagon and you turn the lattice. Yeah. It's a 1D lattice here, it's a 1D diffraction pattern. And you see that the lattice is just changing in real time with the lattice. So this is a forcing mechanism that was also well known in people who have done uh, these kind of things. Just one word, when you misalign the mirror, you see also a large view of things. We don't come too much into details about that. But this is very fascinating for us. So normally, when you misalign the mirror, uh, people doing feedback experiment, they know they should not do it too much, yes. But here, we play so much that we misalign strongly. Yeah. We misalign the mirror that much that finally you almost believe that there will not be light going back to the photorefractive, but still we have some overlapping. Yeah. It's big, but they're still overlapping the fields forward and backward. What you see is that you have a modification of the geometry of the pattern, like it was seen in care medium. But what we see is something very intriguing, is that suddenly when you have a huge misalignment, then you see that the pattern as you saw in the movie is always drifting because of the phase that you're modifying with the misalignment of the mirror interpreted as a phase gradient or, or as a non-locality. But on top of the drift, yes, of the pattern, you see spots appearing very clearly uh, in the picture in the far field, in the near field, sorry. And this, for me, resembles very much things that were published in this group, where suddenly along the stripes that are the convective instability due to the drifting patterns, you have these spots here that are so beautiful, yes, it's in theory. You have these spots that appear like long, localized things very precisely on top of a drift. So um, we're working now on the theory of that to understand things because that was first a care medium. The medium was thin, ours is quite weak. It has few diffraction lengths, so it might modify the things. But this is very un uncommon for me because initially I want to tell you the story that we wanted to see localized structures there, as you understood. Yeah? And we tune, we changed the mirror strongly, and we saw those things. Say, oh, great. Then we went back to the experiment and said, no, no, the mirror is so shifty. So we end up that, okay, that might be a story of I don't know what, of these noises and structures, but we see this experimentally quite clear. Is the region where the dots are, where you still have an overlap from the feedback? Yeah, we still have an overlap. Yeah. It's weak. I mean, the region where the, the forward and the backward beam are overlapping is weak. So it means also most probably that we have strife dynamics in a very weak, in a very small region of the pumping beam. But we are clearly in a convective kind of instability, but we see indeed these spots appearing that are competing strongly. I mean, I have transverse cuts that I could show you with five or six peaks that are just spiking, up, spiking back. I mean, people in here were visiting a lot. I don't know if I should uh, switch off the recording, uh, but uh, they were visiting a lot. They would say, OK, it might be road waves. I don't know the story of road waves, but these are kind of big, huge spikes of light. So they are coming. So, just to tell you a last thing that we have been doing is to try these localized structures. And this is a very preliminary result. Uh, so, you have the homogeneous state, and you know in localized structure, the system should normally move to the pattern, but you want to send light along a single peak. And what happens is that indeed we see that the light stays. They want to tell you the truth that the light stays for minutes yes. in the peak and not for hours. So most probably there's something wrong there. So that's all. I'm sorry I was a little bit long. I thank you for careful attention. Just as a conclusion, uh, 
In photonics, you know that we often manipulate nonlinear systems without knowing almost, or without taking too much care about that. And those dynamical equations are very different. And I've taken here, I mean, myself, I decided to take today three examples of systems that behave very differently. One is a quantum dot is a physics, the second one is a coupled system of oscillators, the third one is an optical pattern. And in all these cases, we have a strong motivation is to understand the richness of all these things to, to, towards applications. I want to acknowledge, and I was very lucky in all my career to have a huge list of collaborators. I want to acknowledge all of them and the funding that I was mentioning uh, in the past. Okay, thank you. Maybe one related to the, to the quantum dot pixels. Uh, you showed the scenario where you have uh, also the elliptically polarized state and the dynamic ones. Um, I could imagine that if you take different quantum dot pixels, you get quite different high refrigerant spittings. How much does uh, the scenario that you find if the, uh, depend on the particular high refrigerant spitting in the first place? So, um, in all the devices we investigated, um, we end up with biofilm splitting, which was quite small in all the cases. This might be very peculiar to the wavegating kind of uh, geometry, but they always were of the order of four to five, six meters, but not much different. So the thing is that I cannot really answer because we don't have devices that have such a large diversity of biofilms. Now, I agree with you. I mean, that we are working also back on the model of and bigger thing in model because we know that if the bifurcation splitting is small or big, also the model tests us different things. But the thing is that uh, most probably you have quantum dot laser physics to look so carefully into that. And we don't know much how to extend the polarization into the quantum dot in the model. It's not that obvious, I mean, but people might have ideas. Um, indeed, the bifurcation should play a big role, but I cannot really answer. Okay, I think that's all for today. Thank you.